Welcome. A few days ago, a major clinical trial for ivermectin in COVID-19 was released out of Malaysia with almost 500 patients with mild to moderate disease and fairly early treatment. That's what I'm going to discuss in this video, the ITEC randomized controlled clinical trial results. So let's get started. This trial, which was just published in JAMA Internal Medicine, is a study on ivermectin treatment on disease progression. It was carried out in Malaysia at 20 clinical centers and one quarantine facility, and it ran from May through October of 2021. The study was just published last week, and it's been gaining a lot of news attention, both because of the size of the trial and some of the details of the trial. Some aspects of the ITEC trial that distinguish it from previous trials on COVID-19 are on this slide. First, it was relatively early treatment. Every patient was enrolled within seven days of symptoms. Second, the patients who took part in this trial had mild to moderate disease. They have a classification system for disease severity in Malaysia, but they also use the WHO classification system. And in the WHO classification system, the disease severity ranged from two to four. Third, it was done in a hospital setting. Many trials on ivermectin for patients with mild to moderate disease have been done in an outpatient setting. That's true, for example, with the principal trial run out of Oxford. In this case, because of the way Malaysia was triaging its COVID patients, patients with even mild symptomatic disease were seen in a hospital setting as a precautionary measure. This has some advantages because it means that their progress through the course of the study can be closely monitored, as well as their compliance with taking the medication. Fourth, it was dealing with high-risk patients. These were patients at least 50 years old, and they had at least one comorbidity, so they were more likely than other patients to develop severe disease. That is advantageous in running a clinical trial for reasons that we'll see very shortly. This is the graphical abstract of the paper, and it provides a high-level summary of the results. They measured outcomes on 490 patients. The intervention involved randomization into groups who either got the standard of care or the standard of care plus ivermectin. In that hospital setting, they were monitoring progression towards severe disease, and the main finding using that outcome was that ivermectin did not prevent progression to severe disease. Actually, as you can see, a slightly higher proportion of the patients in the ivermectin group progressed to severe disease compared to the control group, but this was not statistically significant. This is the study plan, and if we look at it, we can see that it starts by taking patients in when they come to the hospital and they're confirmed with COVID-19. Then, if they're suitable for the study, they get some counseling about recruitment into the study. Ultimately, they randomized 500 patients into the control group or treatment group, either with standard of care or with standard of care plus ivermectin. Now, there were a few dropouts, as happens, and ultimately they were left with 241 patients in the treatment group and 249 patients in the control group for analysis. Okay, just to summarize, because I tend to go long, here are a few trial design highlights. First, as we've seen, 490 patients with mild to moderate disease, all within one week of symptoms were part of this trial. They were high risk patients, so they were at least 50 years old and they had at least one additional risk factor or comorbidity. This was an open label trial, so the patients knew which medication they were taking. The ivermectin dosage was defined by body weight, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day, once a day for five days. Finally, the primary outcome measure was whether they progressed to severe disease. This corresponded to the WHO levels five to nine, but the progression to severe disease that they used in this was a supplemental oxygen requirement if the requirement for oxygen was such 
that they dropped below an SPO2 level of 95%. So you might be wondering, how did they decide on 500 patients? The problem here is one of what's called sample size calculation. And because I like to put a little bit of educational content in my videos, I'll go through this a bit. So this is what they put in the paper about sample size calculation. They say it has a superiority trial design. They use a primary outcome measure of progression to severe disease. They have an expected rate of the primary outcome of 17.5% in the control group. That is, they're expecting 17.5% of patients being treated in the control group high-risk, over-50-year-old people with mild to moderate disease, they expect that 17.5% of those will progress to severe disease, and that's based on characteristics of earlier patients in Malaysia. And then they ask, what if ivermectin reduced that to about half, so 8.75% or a 50% reduction? On the surface, this might seem like a fairly large effect, but it's consistent with what ivermectin advocates have been claiming for an effect of ivermectin in early treatment. So based on that, they do a sample size calculation and they calculate that they will need 462 patients or 231 in each arm to power the study. Then they decide to recruit 500 patients because they expect some of the patients to drop out of the study. Now, if you're not familiar with this type of calculation, I want to walk through it. So this is the basic idea. What we do when we have a study with a dichotomous outcome, well, that means either the drug has an effect or the drug does not have an effect, at least the way we're trying to set this up. So that's the truth, and it's here on the left. The problem is we don't know it before the study, but we do measure outcome of the drug or of the treatment. So, while that's limited to the patient population in the cohort, it either has an effect or it doesn't from how we measure it. We don't know how large the effect is ahead of time, but we want to assess whether the drug has an effect or not. So we describe this study this way. The truth is here on the left, and along the top is what we might infer from this study. So the null hypothesis in this would be that the drug has no effect. So in the truth here on the left, that would be along the top. And in what we infer along the top, that would be on the left. And the alternative hypothesis is on the bottom for truth and on the right for how we conclude. So we could end up drawing a conclusion in any of these four quadrants, but obviously we'd like to be correct. And we can color two of these quadrants, green, for correct decisions. Either the drug doesn't have an effect in truth, and we infer that the drug doesn't have an effect, or the drug has an effect in truth, and we correctly infer, infer that the drug has an effect. So those are the correct conclusions that we might draw from the data. But when we do a study, we're sampling patients and we're making observations. And so it's important to ask, a different question, which is, what if we make a mistake? Well, what kind of mistakes can we make? In this kind of design, we can really only make two kinds of mistakes. We can make a mistake like this, which is to say, we make a mistake where we infer that the drug has an effect, even though, in truth, it doesn't have an effect. In some cases, this might be considered a false positive, and in any case, it's called a type 1 error. And when people talk about a p-value or a significance threshold of 0.05, this is the kind of error that they're talking about. Now, the other way we can make a mistake is in the opposite quadrant. So if the drug actually has an effect, we might miss it. We might mistakenly conclude that the drug does not have an effect, and that's a false negative or a type 2 error. If we have a rate of error that we expect, of this type of error that we expect, we define the power of the experiment as one minus our estimate of that error rate. In most experiments or studies that are set up for these kinds of tests and use these kinds of power calculations, they arbitrarily set the p-value, that is the rate of false positives that they want to be below, to 0.05, 
and you set the rate of a false negative that you would like to be below to 0.2, which is a power of 80%. And that was how this was calculated in the iTech study. Just to be sure, I redid the calculations myself for a range of effects that ivermectin might have. So this is kind of reproducing their example or their sample calculations where one expects that 17.5% of patients will progress to severe disease in the control group and then say a clinically important result would be to drop that in half. So if adding ivermectin to the treatment were to reduce that progression to severe disease by 50%, that would be a clinically important result. So I use that and I plug it into the standard calculations and I get a total of 462 patients. What that means is that if the effect of treatment is that large, dropping the progression to severe disease by half, and if they had 462 patients split between treatment and control, they would have a power of 80% to detect a true effect of ivermectin with a p-value controlled at around 0.05. When I redid that calculation, I got the exact same sample size, but I also looked at a range of possible effect sizes for ivermectin. And that's to illustrate this principle. And what you'll note is that with a smaller effect, so at the closer the ivermectin, this line on the, on the left, the red line on the left, if it were to move to the right, that would be a smaller effect. And with a smaller effect, one would need a much larger number of patients to obtain that level of power. You can also turn this around and ask, well, we have a certain number of patients that are in the trial. How much power is lost if the difference between placebo or between standard of care and standard of care plus ivermectin were different with that sample size? So I did that as well. And what you can see is that we lose power as the sample size stays the same as the effect size decreases. So one does these types of calculations given a model of what a trial is looking for to set for a, an expected threshold of effect size that is clinically meaningful. And so if you've been wondering beforehand, why wouldn't I want to look for a very small effect, like you know a tiny effect, and I hope you can see that if you need to look for a very small effect, you'll need to work with a very large number of patients. I wanna make a couple of additional points before moving on from this. First, this is why it was important that the study had patients at high risk of progression to serious disease, because that meant that the estimated rate of progression would be 17.5% in the control arm. If they had patients at less high risk, this red line would have moved toward the left and it would have been harder to see an effect of ivermectin or any treatment. The second point I want to make is that the same is true for secondary outcomes. So the study was powered for this primary outcome of progression to severe disease. It wasn't powered for secondary outcomes and a, a lower frequency or lower proportion of secondary outcomes is going to reduce dramatically the power of the study to make a reliable detection. And that includes required ventilations and it includes deaths. It means that this study didn't have the statistical power to say anything conclusive about those rare events. All right, enough prep work. Let's talk about the trial results. So we can see here that the primary outcome appears qualitatively worse in the ivermectin group, but just slightly worse. But notably, it did not lead to a significant effect in the results of the test. That is to say, the p-value is not significant. For the secondary outcomes, the results are also all non-significant. Quite a number of ivermectin advocates have latched on to a couple of these secondary outcomes mechanical ventilation and deaths because there are fewer patients who required mechanical ventilation in the ivermectin group than in the control group, and there are fewer patients who died in the ivermectin group than in the control group. I'll get to that in a moment, but 
Overall, we can't really say much other than the trial didn't really detect any efficacy of ivermectin. It was unable to reject the null hypothesis, which is how it was designed. There was no significant effect of ivermectin on progression to severe disease or on any of the secondary outcomes. So that's the main finding. But there were also adverse events reported. And at adverse events, there were quite a few more among patients treated with ivermectin than those with the standard of care. There's a long table of adverse events, and I won't reproduce it here. Most adverse events were non-serious. And one of the limitations of the study is that it was an open-labeled study. So the patients knew they were getting ivermectin, or they knew they were getting the standard of care. And it's certainly possible that patients who know they're in the treatment group may be more likely to report adverse events. So that's a real possibility. But it's also less likely to be the case in this trial than in some other trials. For one, this is in a hospital setting. So even non-serious adverse events like, say, diarrhea are monitored in a hospital setting. The second is that it also held true for serious adverse events like myocardial infarction, anemia, hypotension, and so on. Let me get rid of my face so that I'm not in the way here and you can see. Yes, it held true for severe adverse events as well. These are measured in a hospital setting and they're not subject to ascertain ascertainment bias from the patients themselves. Now, one criticism I've seen of this trial from ivermectin advocates since the results were out is that the medication levels were not high enough. But in fact, the iMask Plus protocol, which is the protocol that is recommended and published by the FLCCC, the most well-known ivermectin advocacy group, uses this same level of medication. So I don't think that's really a valid criticism. They also came in with mild to moderate disease and had to start within a week of symptoms. So another criticism has been that they were treated too late, but this was specifically included in the subgroup analysis. And there was no significant difference between patients treated within the first five days and patients treated later. Now, if anything, the trend toward patients treated earlier did worse for the ivermectin group with a p-value of 0.07. Now, I just did something intentionally, a little bit of pre-bunking, and I, I want to get back to the outcomes here. So what I did was I picked that p-value of 0.07, and I said, hey, that looks like it's in the direction of being worse for early treatment with ivermectin. But that's not at all fair, and I want to get back to the outcomes. We have this primary outcome, and then we have five secondary outcomes. Quite a bit has been made on the internet by ivermectin advocates who said, well, the primary outcome was insignificant, but the outcome with the lowest p-value was all cause in hospital mortality, where only three patients died in the ivermectin group and 10 patients died in the control group. This is an example of what's called p-hacking, or in this case, also cherry picking. Recall that the study was powered to observe a rate of 17.5% progression to severe disease in the control group. And as you can see in the control group, it was actually 17.3%. So that expectation was really right on the money. Secondary outcomes included time to progression to severe disease, no difference. Patients who had mechanical ventilation, this was not significant, but it had a p-value of 0.17, which again, ivermectin advocates wanted to latch on. Patients admitted to the ICU, very similar. All-cause mortality, again, that's the lowest p-value. And, and ivermectin advocates have been pouncing on these two. So among these six outcomes, one primary and five secondary, Ivermectin advocates have been highlighting the two with the lowest p-values in favor of ivermectin. But this is a mistake. It's a mistake for several reasons. One is evident from the reasoning itself. Many of the same people have argued that the study is underpowered, but it's much less well-powered for less frequent events. It was powered for progression to severe disease, the primary outcome. 
and it's much less well-powered for less frequent events like ventilation and death. So you can't argue, on the one hand, it wasn't well-powered for the primary outcome, and then on the other hand, we should pay attention to these even much well less powered uh, p-values that are still not significant, but they happen to be the lowest ones that we see. A second issue is that the all-cause mortality and mechanical ventilation are going to be very, very highly correlated. Most of the people who die are expected to have been ventilated. So that means that the, the deaths are basically choosing from the ones who've already been mechanically ventilated, so you're going to the same well twice. And a third issue is that the argument is effectively reaching into a bag of p-values, six in this case, which means that there are six bytes at the same apple. This is a classic example of motivated reasoning, which is to say going in and finding p-values that favor the interpretation that we want. We can't do that. And even if we do do that, then we also have to address the subgroup analysis because there's a seventh p-value, the one for early treatment with ivermectin, which was even lower, 0.07, with worse outcomes for ivermectin patients. So you can't just selectively go in and pick the p-values that favor your particular interpretation. It's just not scientific to reach into a bag of p-values and pick the ones we like. Now, I don't think progression to severe disease provides much of an argument for harm from ivermectin, and I don't think the mortality or ventilation outcomes provide an argument for benefit from ivermectin. Basically, the results are unsurprising in a negative sense, and like, there's no result there's no, that ivermectin is not doing much in this study, or there's no evidence that ivermectin is doing much in this study. It's not surprising that some p-values are low. And in fact, if you have six opportunities, so if you have six p-values and you choose the lowest of those six p-values, more than half of the time, you'll get one p-value that's less than 0.17. And just under half of the time, you'll get one p-value that's lower than 0.09. But if they're very highly correlated, that second number will go up. So it's just not reasonable to look at these p-values alone because we've gone into a set of p-values and picked out the ones that favor our interpretation. That's a form of confirmation bias. If we repeat it, it becomes a form of cognitive dissonance that we use to support our prior beliefs. But of course, this stuff does get spun quite heavily, and this has been spun quite heavily just over the last few days. So let's take a look at this. So here's a video that came out from Dr. Mobin, who started his video by saying that he just can't spin anything and it's just data, and then he immediately went into a very strong spin on the trial results in this video, and then he followed it up with another video which was entirely spin. In both cases, the spin was to basically dive down and emphasize the mortality data, just pull that one p-value out as if it's the only meaningful outcome because that was the one he was interested in. In the second video, he did what I think is a really remarkable piece of, of p-hacking, where he took the patients progressing to severe disease and he made up a contingency table with the ones progressing to severe disease and then put that together with death and decided that was statistically significant. Uh, this is uh, totally inappropriate and it's kind of wild, but he did it anyway and he wasn't alone. Other people did the same thing and this kind of flawed reasoning seems to be followed a lot on Twitter by people who are advocates of ivermectin for COVID-19. So that's where I'm gonna leave it for this video. I wanna follow this video up with some other videos with guests. I have a couple of guests planned. On this particular topic, I'm going to be bringing in a guest who's thought a lot about these issues, has thought a lot about statistical testing, p-hacking, appropriate use of statistical tests and alternatives to conventional thinking about statistical significance and conventional thinking about the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And I'm looking forward to having him on in an upcoming video. If you like this content, feel free to give it a like, subscribe, let me know in your comments what you'd like to see addressed in future videos. And in the meantime, stay safe.